and I'll do uh, I'll cover some of the retrospective notes uh, that led us to the OTP rewrite, and that'll lead us into a discussion of the OTP right, rewrite, which is how we got there, what we wrote, and uh, more retrospective notes, and, and then I'll sum it up with some key takeaways, and then hopefully have some time for Q and A. So Wasm Cloud is a platform for writing secure, portable business logic that can run anywhere from the edge to the cloud. Our goals with it were uh, primarily to reduce the amount of boilerplate uh, that people were writing in microservices uh, and uh, functions uh, as a service in the cloud. Uh, we want to eliminate uh, tight coupling with non-functional requirements. We feel that people should be writing features and not uh, non-functional requirements code. Uh, we wanted the platform to be secure by default and uh, Taking advantage of WebAssembly, uh, we wanted the uh, units of deployment to be portable and lightweight, and uh, we also embraced the actor model for uh, the units of deployment. Wasm Cloud, uh, the developer workflow, uh, you create an actor, uh, which is a uh, single-threaded unit uh, business logic. Uh, the actor is then signed. Uh, we embed JSON web tokens directly inside the WebAssembly file. And then the actor will consume capability providers through abstract contracts, like uh, a web server, message broker, key value store, uh, HTTP client, and so on. Uh, instead, of instead of consuming capabilities or non-functional requirements directly and having a tight coupling, the actors uh, consume abstract interfaces and that allows for loose coupling and quite a bit of uh, runtime flexibility. You deploy your actors to a uh, flattened topology mesh network that we call a lattice. Uh, you deploy capability providers to the same lattice and then you publish link definitions that link the actors and capability providers. And this essentially allows for the construction and composition of distributed applications where your business logic is written as actors. Now the sample actor that I've got on screen here is written in Rust and uh, hopefully the the code doesn't look all that baffling but the, the main key points here is that we're implementing an HTTP server in this actor which means that this actor handles incoming HTTP requests and returns an HTTP response. As I mentioned earlier, just a few slides ago, the, we have a code that works against abstractions and not against tight coupling. So this actor code is completely unaware of what uh, the web server uh, product is that we're using, how it's configured, and any other runtime non-functional concerns. Then we have this increment counter function, which uses a key value abstraction. Uh, we're using the increment function here. And again, it's worth, it's uh, important to note here that there is no client connection to the key value store here. Uh, there's no configuration, and nor do we even know which key value store it is. This code doesn't know or care. Uh, whether we're using Redis or Cassandra or an in-memory cache or anything else. The, the code will do its job regardless of which capability provider it gets attached to at runtime. So I want to uh, switch over real quick here and give you a, a demo of what Wasm Cloud is and uh, what we built. The demonstration is the OTP version of the application. Okay, I'm going to walk you through a uh, quick demo of the Wasm Cloud host runtime, and we'll do so through our web-based dashboard UI, which is one of the many things that we're able to do easily uh, as a result of the OTP rewrite. We essentially got access to uh, the ability to embed a Phoenix application directly in our host runtime uh, for free. So the first thing that we can do with the host runtime is start an actor. And so I'll pick uh, one from uh, registry. And this is our echo actor, which does uh, just as you might imagine, it's essentially the hello world version of uh, an actor. And this is a signed WebAssembly module sitting out in this OCI registry. 
so that has uh, started and the status will switch to uh, healthy as soon as the next heartbeat cycle goes through and so I can start a capability provider and this provider is going to be the HTTP server now once that provider is started I'll define a link between the actor and the provider the contract ID in this case is uh, WASM Cloud HTTP server and the configuration values that I want to send is setting the port number that this is going to listen on so now that that has been set I should be able to uh, exercise this actor by going through the HTTP server so if I run this I now get uh, the response and again this is essentially the hello world version of WASM Cloud where the echo actor has returned the HTTP request that it was given and so essentially what we have is the Phoenix web application providing a uh, interactive surface that, that developers can use to uh, poke and prod their WASM cloud host, uh, start actors and capability providers and all of this sits on top of and reuses uh, with no duplication the core runtime so the pre-elixir WASM cloud architecture uh, looks fairly straightforward um, on paper and essentially what we have is each actor in the system uh, is serviced by a thread, an OS thread actually. The message bus and uh, lattice relay are also OS threads. Uh, host controller is a component that's responsible for creating new instances of either actors or capability providers. This is uh, something that Elixir people will uh, recognize pretty quickly as a supervisor. Uh, and again each of the capability providers also has its own thread and again uh, with this being written in Rust uh, all of these components needed to communicate with each other uh, without uh, running afoul of Rust's borrow checker and so the, the, the code in here is uh, uh, pretty heavily laden with spaghetti and uh, very difficult to read so when we did a retrospective, actually we've done we've done many, but during the, the many retrospectives that we've done on the WASM Cloud Host runtime, uh, what we noticed is that we were spending uh, about 90% of our time uh, writing code in service of boilerplate. And uh, this boilerplate was predominantly around networking and concurrency and uh, all you know all of the other details for building a distributed system the irony there is that our main goal with wasm cloud was to remove boilerplate from the developer experience and so it it seemed wrong in many ways that uh, in in our building of a framework to remove boilerplate we were doing uh, most of our work in boilerplate uh, when we looked at the reasons for why we needed to change. So the, the reasons for new code and deployments were predominantly around concurrency, distributed systems, networking, more concurrency, uh, CLI tooling, and then finally uh, features. And again, we wanted to be able to spend more time working on features and less time working on things like concurrency and distributed systems. Um, a couple of the things we noticed were that contributors were afraid to touch the core. Uh, while we had many contributors to the WASM Cloud project as a whole, uh, I was largely the only one contributing to the core, and most of that was due to the, the complexity there and the fact that the Rust code was difficult to maintain, difficult to read, uh, and uh, very difficult to change without um, breaking things new features in the host runtime uh, were difficult to add, difficult to test and when we looked at the roadmap of our desired features basically everything that we had on our plan was um, you know uh, read like the OTP feature list 
Uh, so we had all of these things that we needed to build and very few of them were features that we wanted to build into the framework and most of them were all concurrency and distributed system stuff. So one of the things that Rust uh, has for a tagline is uh, fearless concurrency. If you look at the Rust language homepage, you'll see that fearless concurrency is right up there at the top. And uh, one of the things that we noticed in building Wasm Cloud was that fearless concurrency is not the same thing as joyful concurrency. So it's one thing to know that the concurrency code is safe and it's another thing for your concurrency code to be easy or uh, even fun to write. So if we look at some of this Rust code, um, this actually is our third rewrite of concurrency code and this is the cleanest it's ever been in Rust and uh, sadly, it's still largely inscrutable to most people. There are a number of different things going on here. There's async code, there's future uh, awaiting uh, you can see in bold. There's a function in there called into actor which actually converts a future into a different kind of future and then there's a map on the future and none of this is uh, easily understood. There. Are uh, even I don't remember exactly uh, how all of this concurrency stuff works, and I'm the one who wrote it. So this is a, a very bad smell, and so one of the things we wanted to get rid of was uh, code like this. So let's move away from the old Wasm Cloud, and now I can talk about the OTP rewrite. Uh, the OTP write started with the journey of a thousand or three uh, rewrites. It felt like a thousand sometimes. The first time we rewrote it uh, was very early on. Uh, it was early days. No one noticed uh, because we had very few consumers. And we essentially converted all of the regular Rust code into async Rust code. Uh, so uh, futures and awaits. The next rewrite, uh, we thought we would simplify things by converting the async code and the use of channels and explicit operating system threads to uh, a framework called Actix, which is an actor framework uh, that uh, the code you just saw on the previous slide. And we thought we would untangle some spaghetti there and uh, during this rewrite we essentially ended up generating newer fresher spaghetti code uh, when we and then finally uh, what I wanted to talk about today is we rewrote from Rust to Elixir and again uh, the more we looked at our roadmap the more we realized that the features that we were trying to create were already implemented for us in things like Erlang and OTP So let's take a look at the new architecture. Um, there's a Wasm Cloud host, which is a uh, Phoenix application that I'll get into in a minute, but you saw that during the demo. And then inside the host core, we have a number of supervisor hierarchies. So we have an actor supervisor, a capability super supervisor. Uh, there's a distributed cache loader, uh, and again, we were since we were in there making changes anyway, we thought, well, let's just upgrade our, our distributed cache. And it was actually fairly easy to do because of, of the fact that we were using OTP. There's a control interface server, which uh, allows the uh, host runtime to be interacted with remotely, uh, an event streaming system, and uh, NATS, our message broker. And this is all fairly straightforward and uh, far more organized and easier to uh, get in and maintain than our previous Rust version. We did, however, keep quite a bit of functionality in Rust, and that was actually one of the huge benefits of using Elixir, was that uh, through, uh, through a package like Rustler, we were able to keep a bunch of functionality. Uh, we were able to, uh, essentially, we retrieve our OCI images, uh, open container initiative are uh, from OCI distribution compliant registries. 
uh, we create and read the provider archive files. Uh, extracting and validating JSON web tokens is still in Rust. Our generation and use of uh, ED25519 keys is also still in Rust. The signing of invocations so that we have uh, anti-forgery tokens on them, that's still done in Rust. Uh, detecting the, coast core, the host core labels like the operating system family, architecture, and so on, that's done in Rust so that we have a consistent set of names uh, for uh, OS and architecture. And then finally, uh, WebAssembly execution itself is actually done via Rustler because the WASMX package uses a Rust crate underneath. So uh, while we did do a rewrite into OTP, we still managed to keep a considerable amount of our previous investment in uh, some lower level uh, Rust crates. So the, one of the things that we ran into was uh, this, uh, the dirty scheduler when it comes to using NIFs. Um, one of our, uh, actually a couple of our Rust functions that we use through Rustler uh, needed to be on the dirty I.O. scheduler um, and we ran into that the hard way. Um, uh, this is one uh, where when we download from an OCI compliant registry uh, we had that we needed to be on the dirty scheduler because otherwise the uh, the beam would uh, shut down our NIF functions before they were finished. Uh, similarly we needed a couple of functions uh, I believe the one of our encryption functions requires the dirty CPU scheduler. So what did we like about uh, converting to OTP? Uh, for one, we got a web-based user interface for free. Uh, we used and uh, fully embraced the Phoenix framework. And as a result, uh, we essentially got a web-based user interface for free. And we moved from what Rust considers fearless concurrency to what I, what I refer to as joyful concurrency, where we're able to describe our concurrent systems and our distributed applications in a way uh, that is easy and straightforward to maintain. We were able to focus on features and not re-implementing uh, OTP. Uh, we made extensive use of declarative resiliency and supervisor hierarchies, which we were uh, we were uh, unable to do in Rust because of the difficulty and complexity of the code. And uh, even uh, self-declared uh, Elixir newbies on the core team are actively contributing to the new OTP host. So people no longer fear contributing to the core, and uh, the core itself is a uh, far less tangled ball of mud and is more self-documenting. So what did we like less? Uh, there is actually nothing we didn't like, uh, but there were uh, some bumps in the road during our migration and our rewrite. Uh, for example, um, those of us who have uh, years of Rust experience were uh, scared to death of the concept of untyped data. Uh, not being able to have that strong typing felt very strange and very alien to us. Uh, we were able to use type specs and uh, tools like Dialyzer to mitigate that fear somewhat, but uh, it still feels very, very uh, scary and intimidating to uh, write loosely typed or untyped code. And there's a fairly steep learning curve for creating and publishing releases and uh, automating everything through uh, CI builds. Um, but Again, that wasn't all that difficult to get over. We had a lot of scope creep uh, during the rewrite. Uh, sadly, that, that actually wasn't OTP's fault. Most of us, uh, as we were rewriting things, we sat around and said, well, since we're rewriting this, we might as well just improve this or improve that. And so we ended up adding a lot of scope rather than just doing a, a straight up rewrite. The end result is certainly better than we expected, but it took us longer than we uh, expected also. Uh, one of the things we've noticed is that it seems fairly hard to find uh, self-proclaimed proclaimed Elixir developers uh, than it does Rust. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, taking people who've had no exposure to Elixir and getting them up and running on Elixir and OTP is actually uh, fairly easy and straightforward and has a significantly um, less painful learning curve than Rust. So I think our, our largest key takeaway here is uh, Verding's first rule of programming, which is that any sufficiently complicated concurrent program in another language contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-ridden, slow implementation of half of Erlang. And in short, what that means is that the further down the road we went towards building a reliable distributed system, the more it, it became obvious that we were essentially just doing a really bad job of rewriting OTP. So some of the lessons learned and our calls to action. Uh, Rustler may be one of the coolest libraries ever. This is the thing that gives us the best of both worlds, what, that allows us to write Elixir code and uh, Rust code and have them interact. Uh, Wasmx, the WebAssembly ex executor, uses Rustler. Uh, holding retrospectives early and often gives us the chance to make decisions about whether we're going to do a rewrite and um, what the impact of that might be. And we want to be able to plan to benefit from hindsight. So rather than waiting until we have completely released a 1.0 product to stop and take a look at how things are going, we want to do that more often so that we can you know, plan for these kinds of rewrites to learn to uh, incorporate the lessons that we've learned. Uh, one of the things that I want personally to do is to take a look at Gleam. The, it's a programming language that I refer to as a rusty elixir. It's uh, for someone who uses both Rust and Elixir. This looks uh, fairly promising. And a purely subjective review from myself and other team members is that Elixir is a joy to use. It's actually relaxing and has a very zen-like quality to it. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Elixir gives us uh, an experience that I refer to as joyful concurrency uh, rather than simply fearless. And so that's it. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this and uh, there's some uh, plenty of uh, questions. And again, uh, you know, feel free to uh, reach out and contact us on Twitter. My handle is at Kevin Hoffman and uh, you know, more than willing to answer any questions we don't have time for. Thanks. Um, Kevin, can we just make sure you're there? I'm still here. Great. Uh, so, any any questions, folks? Um, those of us online, uh, you can you can type them up uh, on the session Q and A. In person. Anyone? All right, so Kevin, um, I have one. Do you have any sort of um, examples, uh, sort of example applications, uh, somewhere you've used um, Wasm Cloud, maybe, uh, I don't know, a customer, a client, something like that, uh, that you could tell us about? Uh, so there's a couple of them uh, that are using Wasm Cloud in production that I can't actually uh, mention specifically, but uh, there's, uh, one uh, that I can think of where uh, the, the, the company makes uh, consumer set-top devices that share uh, 5G bandwidth uh, in a line of sight uh, application. And all of the software on those devices is uh, running Wasm Cloud Actors. And they're doing live updates through uh, Wasm Cloud's uh, networking system. Uh, I, I think they're still probably running the, the original version, so they're still on the Rust version. The, the OTP one, uh, we're actually releasing that uh, sometime this week. Okay, sounds great. Hey, Kevin, great uh, presentation. I have one uh, regarding um, Cloudflare workers because you can also run a WebAssembly there, and I'm wondering whether you consider them as your competition or maybe some kind of platform that uh, you could run Wasm Cloud on? Uh, so they're not competition. Uh, I think they they fill two different roles. So with, with Cloudflare workers, 
you're specifically running uh, WebAssembly code that uh, is designed to run on the edge with a very limited set of APIs. So it's more, uh, more uh, purpose fit type of uh, application, whereas WASM Cloud is designed to be more of a general purpose platform. Uh, uh, WASM Cloud hosts run on the edge as well as in the cloud or on Raspberry Pis or your workstation or anything else. So it's designed to stitch together uh, compute that's running at the edge as well as in the back end, whereas Cloudflare workers are specifically uh, focused on the edge.